The Midnight Hour, now on BBC Two. In the chair, Leslie Riddick. To the midnight hour and a whole new concept in democracy. No, Rupert Murdoch isn't launching his own party, but those strange folk on the internet are launching themselves straight into our TV sets and before long straight into the heart of our political process. Says who? Well, some of the biggest names in the computer industry who announced yesterday they'll soon be able to bypass PC terminals and put the internet directly onto every TV set in the land. And of course, if the interactive internet becomes the centrepiece of every living room on the electoral register, we could have local referenda every week. And the internet terminal could become the electoral equivalent of the hole-in-the-wall cash dispenser. Now, you'll have spotted a few ifs there. At present, the internet is definitely a minority pursuit. But the political parties are already there. There are the conventional parties touting for new recruits. Familiar high-profile pressure groups are already using it to announce new campaigns. There's the possibility of international argument over the kitchen table, with users like this American group surfing the waves of democracy. And never mind hands across the water, the all-party people's talk in Northern Ireland offers a safe meeting of minds across the sectarian divide. Down at the very local level, the Lewisham People's Web is giving some Londoners a say in council decisions. And at the lower end of the evolutionary scale, SkinNet is giving more sensitive souls serious cause for concern. But that's the trouble with the freedom of the net. It carries material that's racist, offensive and pornographic. And it's probably beyond government control. So too, I hope, are the free thinkers gathered round the table tonight to help me visualise this new virtual democracy that could be just round the corner. Oliver Morton is editor of the computer magazine Wired. Hardly the sort of job one associates with an historian, which is what he is. Jeff Hoon is Labour MP for Ashfield and shadow spokesman on the superhighway. At present, he uses it to entertain his children, while Tony Blair uses it to make interesting deals with BT. Jeanne Tier co-founded Siberia, London's first internet cafe, two years ago. And our next guest has his own way of saying hello. Hi. My name is Nigel Evans, and I'm the Member of Parliament for the Ribble Valley in Lancashire. On my website, you'll be able to analyse my views on law and order, Europe, and education, to mention but just three hot issues. Well, I can't wait. <laughs> just to confirm the impression that I'm an internet sceptic, I wonder will it really affect the lives of millions of people or just the lives of every sad train spotter in the universe, Nigel? Yes, I'm a bit of an anorak, I'm afraid, on these sort of things. Um, Apparently, there are almost two million people in Britain on the internet, in, internet at the moment who can access the internet, 30 million people worldwide. Uh, and it certainly does give me a vehicle to put across the views that I have on politics, the Conservative Party. You've mentioned a few uh, groups tonight who've got their pages up there. There are a number of others who've also got their pages there. So you think it's going to have clout? It's going to have massive clout. It's happening big in America. They've got... Um, United States uh, elections this year, and they all the major candidates will have their pages up there. A lot right. of Americans will be accessing okay. those well, pages. Well, before we start drifting off across uh, the Atlantic, let's stay here. What do you reckon, Oliver? Well, I mean, I've seen some of those American pages, and I've heard some of the American speeches, and I must admit I'm not convinced that America is significantly in advance of Britain in terms of putting politics onto the net. But in the long run, I think... Um, computer networks of all sorts, the internet included, are obviously going to be a place for political debate because they're a place where you build communities and that's the essence of the, of the beast. Right, Jeff, what do you think? To be really democratic, the equipment has to be a lot easier to use 
and it has to be much cheaper. At the moment, it's still for enthusiasts and relatively affluent enthusiasts who can afford thousand pounds for the equipment to get online who could understand put it all together and make it work that's why it's for people like Nigel the enthusiasts well and people like Jenna you must have a few thousand stashed away to have the facilities you do well, is it going to change people's lives democratically I think it is because it allows people to interact with content and to talk to the people that can't um, it's a technology which invites people in and if you think of the television or of the press that's given the pe people a sense of what's going on around the world um, the net does that in an, in an environment which allows people to talk back and that's what's great about the cafe and great about the internet. Right. Um, forgive me if I'm just sort of less than bowled over just immediately. I mean, to me, looking at the net or try attempting to kind of approach it, it looks like a very messy sort of thing. I mean, there's lots of information everywhere. It's very difficult to feel that you can be guided through everything we can compare it with, papers, television. There's a structure there. It's just a, it seems to be so, so random. I think that's um, what's attractive about the net because anyone who wants to publish can get online and put their views across and that's what people think, that's what people find as an aspiration on the internet. That's what's fun about it and you'll find your way, there's lots of search engines which you can use to find out about the issues that you're interested in. So it's a bit like you find the devices or the pages which you think are interesting and then you can go back to them continually. So right. it's a forum for people to get involved. Okay, but I mean, there's one issue uh, which is, is uh, what sort of information you might be getting out of it. The other is who you're communicating with. Oliver, I have this terrible sort of stereotype of people in anoraks and train spotters and so on. You must be so sick of hearing these stereotypes. Well, actually, you know, the, uh, you've never heard them before. I've never heard them never before. Heard them before. Happens, our office overlooked the uh, platforms of London Bridge Station so we can spot trains all day long without leaving uh -huh. our terminals, which is very heaven. Um, no, I mean, it's why, just... Why do we get these totally false ideas then? Because people put them out. I mean, they're not totally false. Of course, and for, in the 1980s, people who used computers were, you know, putting together their own kits uh, until they got IBM PCs, and then they were mastering this arcane world of DOS, the, uh, the original IBM operating system, unless they'd bought Apple. Um, and, you know, it did require a little bit of perseverance. It required the sort of personality that's interested in sort of like making sure that your Go sub loops do the things that they're meant to do. Um, but now it's not really like that. It's very easy to use a web browser. It's really not very difficult well, at all. I'll tell you what, if it's easy to do that, why haven't you got a website, Jeff? Here you are, the shadow spokesman on this superhighway. You haven't even got a site. No, and that's a deliberate choice for the moment. One of the fascinating things about the web is that it transcends geographical boundaries. It transcends constituency boundaries. And one of the troubles that my colleagues have who have a website is that it obviously encourages contact from all around the world. Oh, lordy, lordy, I thought that's why you wanted it. Well, no, I was elected to represent people in Ashfield, and they are very keen that I should work hard for them. They're not so keen that I should answer <laughs> Nigel's letters, for example. <laughs> and one of the problems with the she website, would, yeah. undoubtedly, <laughs> is that you do not know where the material's coming from. There's no necessity for anybody to put an address on it. Uh, very hard to track it down. And in fact, there is actually a parliamentary convention that says we can't answer yeah. material from other people's constituencies. So I think it's an area where democracy and our democracy has to catch up with the technology. But Jeff, you, you can have a standard reply if anybody does write to you uh, where you're not quite sure where they've come from. But I've had a constituent of mine who's contacted me from Abu Dhabi, who's got a house in my constituency, who will have a vote in my constituency at the next general election. And so it's given him an opportunity to uh, write uh, on a particular problem that he had uh, with taxation, and I'm able to respond to him. Other people in my constituency are now writing to me via email, um, not just those who are accessing my web pages, but just using the email. It's so like it's all just these foreign trips you're going to lose just it. before the election. There's no need for you to move anywhere. Well, now. I think the important thing is that uh, we've estimated that by the time the next election comes about, which may be uh, in 1997, there will be three million British people on the net. Now I know. Um, of several MPs who've got majorities of well less than 100. Uh, the people who access MPs and the information that we give via the net, their votes would be vitally important, well, irrespective okay. of which party right, well, we represent. Well, tell me this then. You, you can see a point in reaching out to people to, 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 mm -hmm. to tell them what you want them to hear. Yeah. Now, just be honest with me here. Has anybody actually got in touch with you? How, how many people are really desperate to speak to you? Lots. Well, lots of people lots are desperate to speak to me. Yes, of course they are. At the moment, though, uh, the vast majority use as the term, terminology of snail mail uh, is the ordinary letter. Uh, but increasingly, they're using uh, email. And Can next you put a year, number on it? You know, no, I, dozen, I can't at the moment. Hundreds, no, I, I've, thousands. Probably, I've probably had, uh, in the last couple of months, probably 150 people 
who have emailed me right. messages, which okay. is quite a lot. Nigel, while we've got you on the rack, let's turn a little bit further <laughs> here. Um, wh when people, maybe you, you have, have told us that you've put your thoughts on Europe, on beef, in fact, was preoccupying you before you came yeah. here tonight. New page tonight uh, yes. for those uh, who Well, we don't want everyone rushing away from pages. the set just oh. yet, you know, Nigel. <laughs> yeah. right, hold so on, here hold we on, are. You've got hold Europe, you've got beef, you've got all the rest of it. Yeah. Ha have you had response, debate, dialogue with people that has made you go back and change anything? No, not change it. Perhaps one or two spelling errors that have uh, creeped crept right. into it, but uh, so certainly not changed my views on the subjects that I've put up there, but it's engaged me in dialogue, uh, which I'm more than happy to, to do, um, to where people have said, uh, we disagree with you on this, that or the other, or uh, we, we, we put a quiz on there to, uh, for, for people to say where unemployment is rising faster, whether it's in France, Germany, or it's in the United Kingdom. Oh. Uh, well, no, it's, it's important because it's, uh, there again, it draws people into the dialogue of, uh, of comparing what's happening in Britain, inward investment and the economy, and what's happening in the rest of Europe. Right. And so therefore I'm using the internet as an opportunity, whereby you've got all the newspapers here, and I could uh, either write letters or I could write articles for the newspapers, and they've got editorial control. On the inter internet, there is no editorial control whatsoever. I right. can write an article, as I've done tonight, and on no what went journalists. on in the chamber, and uh, nobody oh, says you this can't must be write be marvellous. That. But, Jenny, I mean, do, do you sense that there's a bit of a smoke screen going on here? I mean, I don't know if, if, if you feel you can be this robust with them, but, I mean, are these two MPs genuinely looking for the kind of dialogue that you're talking about? Well, I think that um, lots of people are very disillusioned with the political process in Britain and lots of people are looking to other groups um, to communicate and to do things. There's lots of green groups who are online. There's lots of groups which are challenging censorship online. So by and large, people are looking to find their interests and I don't think it's the political parties that they're looking to. I think it's the single issue groups and even I think one of the biggest discussions around the next ele election is going to be groups outside of the political mainstream who are coming in with different right, ideas. Right, so to be honest, I, d I know you won't be sitting looking over the shoulders of everybody in your cafe, but you don't see lots of them frantically trying to find Nigel's email number or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's honest. actually the issues that, that people are interested in, not I think getting so. touch I think people MPs. would like the fact that there's a bit of a personal touch, and if Nigel's up there, possibly people will go and have a look and see what his views are. I think lots of people feel that politicians are hidden behind their parties. They themselves don't have personal views and they don't put them across. Well, can I ask you, Jeff, do you feel these, these politicians are coming out from behind their parties or just using the technology to make it, to put up a good show? Well, I think Nigel's putting up a reasonable show. I, um, and he left the little voice clip we heard, we heard just now. Actually, I found it sitting on my computer this morning because it had downloaded itself from your website when I wasn't looking. Um, <laughs> don't worry, this doesn't happen unless you go to the website. It's not something that's going to sort of like spread. Uh, I, I think in the long run, though, what, what really interests me is, is following, up, fo following on from that point about single issue groups, there's an experiment going on in Holland called Teledemocracy, which takes the idea a little bit further, which is not that you vote for parties or referenda on, at your screen, but that you turn your vote into a little bit of software. It's protected by encryption in the same way that um, something you, that you uh, want to be very proud. What about the little one came in there? It's, it's in code. It's right. in code, so right. no one else can can mess around with it. Yeah. And you can take your vote and you can cast it, or you can give it to someone you trust, and they can cast it. So this is already happening. Uh, this is being tried out in North Brabant uh, in ha in Holland. For what sort of election? For well, what sort of purposes? This is a, this is a local. Uh, this being used for local environmental right. issues. So. You don't, the, the, but the long-term point of this is that you don't actually have to best political power in the established parties, which are monopolizing it. You can give your mandate to whomever you choose. And that sort of thing strikes me as being, you know, a remarkable challenge to these gentlemen. Well, okay, take, take, if you take that challenge, can you see it coming in as something that could, let's just say, start off at local level, that could do what Lewisham's doing at the moment? They've got um, all sorts of exercises in local democracy happening, but could you be having local referenda to try and sort out problems? Would that be something that Labour would support? Yes, you can, and there are tremendous potential there for developing reactions to proposals for new roads, new factories, the kinds of local issues that really do get people very worked up and very anxious to communicate their views to politicians. But, and I think it's a big but, if it's going to be really democratic, you've got to have large numbers of people who can get online, who can make their views known. Otherwise, you end up with the kind of situation that happened uh, after the Second World War in the United States, when they conducted the first telephone poll, and it produced a Republican win by a landslide. The reality, in fact, was that because the more affluent people could have a telephone, they were more likely to be Republican, and therefore it distorted the poll. And, in fact, Truman won comfortably. And what we have to avoid in 
arguing for democracy is that we simply have those people who can afford to be online participating and not the great mass of the population. Right, well, it, it'll be some, some way down the line, no doubt, but uh, I believe the internet will do two things as far as local democracy, democracy is concerned. One is that it will give information. Uh, and if information was only coming from one group, then I think that uh, a poll mm -hmm. would be quite dangerous. But I'm sure that there will be conflicting views on all sorts of things as far as local issues are concerned and even national issues. And secondly, it will allow people to respond, to be interactive, which of course they can't do at the moment. So I think that the internet is going to be absolutely essential, but it's going to be several years down the line when, as Jeff says, that uh, the technology is going to become affordable and everybody will have it in their living room. I, mean, I just wonder, Jenny, will this begin to, to, to call some of the politicians bluff because there, there are many people who say they would like to have uh, more engaged citizenry, that it's not good enough that everyone should just be voting every five years. Good grief, you know, when the, the technology is finally there, there's no reason not to have referendum whenever, wherever you want them. I think one of the disappointing things that I found is when I went and looked at the Labour Party site and the Conservative Party site, there wasn't that much information on those sites. There were, there were a few policies, but they weren't giving people real content about what's going on. But can on. you look ahead? I mean, you're a visionary bunch here. Can you look ahead, let's say 10 years, 15 years, um, can you think that there could be what has been described in San Francisco yesterday, which is that uh, the technology could be bypassing the terminals and whacking straight into everyone's TV sets? Well, in that case, it's very possible that everybody could have effectively a voting machine sitting right in their, in their midst. Sure. I think what's happening in politics is there's the decentering of politics and certainly I think the fear for a lot of establishment parties with the internet is that it's a mechanism which makes a nonsense of the nation state because suddenly you can talk to people all around the world, you can vote right around the world and it suggests a higher or a better humanism than just the nation state and the interests of the nation state. And so I think for lots of political parties, these changes su suggest a different model which they're not ready to take up. And I think lots of the political discussion today, all the big books are about the crisis of the establishment and a sense in which their institutions are outdated. No, I, I agree. And uh, what it's done in many ways, it's, it's thrown us, as, as well as the technology everybody talks about the future, it's thrown us back as well. And if you look back to Athenian democracy, when you could get every citizen in a football stadium or whatever it was, in a stadium, and they would make the decisions for their particular town, and then it was because, obviously, the cities and towns grew too large that we went on to representative democracy. What the new technology does is it means that we can go back and you can get the entire city or the entire country back into a stadium all of a sudden, and then you could, several years down the line, as I say, when we've got all these uh, machines in people's homes that they can afford, pl plus smart cards so that you've got the confidentiality <laughs> and whatever, then you could have a referendum in the country down the line which would be secure and people would have their say. Oh, and it's a dilemma as far as representative, de well, representative this is, democracy this is from concerned. someone who doesn't even believe in participating in Europe, Nigel, so I'm <laughs> curious no, about no, no. I believe in seen. participating you, in you Europe. You all resisted <laughs> so bravely up to now, so just do all of that. to get it on, I must that. Admit, I feel that my most interactive in a crowd of 100,000, um, it's not you know, it's it's great for Nuremberg rallies and for rock concerts, but it's not, I think, actually the best way to reach decisions to stand in a very, very large crowd. Um, I wouldn't say that, that, you know, I wouldn't say unmediated democracy was necessarily, and in fact, I'm, I'm sure that electronic democracy does not have to be unmediated, uh, unmediated democracy. It does not have to be pure direct democracy. It may be in some places. But, but um, isn't there, I mean, uh, I may be getting confused here because I thought the vision that you were conjuring up was everyone sort of sitting in their houses, engaging in some kind of um, cyberspacey way in some large event. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, maybe I'm just old fashioned, but I mean, there is a thing called an event yeah. and it's an actual time space. Everybody's there. There's a yeah. feeling, there's oratory, there's, you know, there's group dynamics. I mean, we wouldn't be the same <coughs> if we were just pitter pattering on bits of, com you know, computer tonight, would we? But this is, this is the future, and, and, and <laughs> you will have, um, uh, as uh, the uh, lines become faster, uh, unfortunately with modems, etc., they need to be a lot quicker than they currently are, and several years down the line they will be a lot quicker. You'll have videos up there, and people will be able to talk to people in their living rooms, give the political message, whatever it happens to be, not just parties, but as you say, political interest groups as well, and they will give their message down the line, and then 
the, the voting could take place over a number of days. It doesn't have to be at one particular time uh, in, in right. space. Okay. And well, the well, people's well, voice would be heard. Well, let me see. Is there anybody that can fo follow me along my sentimental journey towards <laughs> this feeling that there's still got to be a kind of coming together of people? I mean, you're the one who sp I suppose spends most time behind a terminal. Uh, can you see any problems with democracy becoming something that's a very private uh, affair in your house? Well, I think um, the advantage of the internet is that it puts you in touch, so that's what's great about it. And lots of people are scared about technology because they feel it is an, a medium which is antisocial. I think that it's possibly more social because it opens up many more opportunities. I meet loads and loads of people just through people emailing me online who I would never meet in a hundred million years physically. So I think that um, people, will, people are still going to be social, they're going to, be, they're going to meet each other in public places, but possibly they'll do that for better reasons than just for shopping okay. or going down but the street. But if we think that the net can't be a public place, I mean you can put a lot of people together, you can have a discussion. The problem is that as in, as in many things, if you put too many people in a place having a discussion, you do need some sort of structure to it. And no, I'm not disagreeing that net democracy is going to be a right. very major thing. Okay, structure. So I'm glad you mentioned that because I'd like to move on to uh, another part of this debate, which is about censorship. Now, ob obviously, the people are worried that there's pornography on the net. There's some pretty dodgy political messages. There's racist stuff that can be accessible. Now, I mean, first of all, is it physically possible to, to remove stuff? If anybody was going to go in as a censor, would it be physically possible to remove anything that was dodgy? Oliver, you could, it's, it's physically, it's practically possible to make it difficult to reach things. Um, to make it impossible for people who want to reach things to reach them, no, that's very, very difficult. I haven't yet seen anyone convincingly argue that they'd be able to do that. You can make things difficult. You can bully people into cutting off service to the computers that um, have particular material on them. And don't forget, the internet is a whole lot of computers that are offering things, and people are going around asking for them. And you can cut off the computers that are offering Nazi propaganda. That happened recently um, uh, because of laws in Germany. What the result was that um, non-Nazi um, freedom of speech activists started copying the Nazi material all over academic uh, computers in America so that you could still get it because the people on the net have a very strong ethic that the way to deal with information you don't like, views you don't like, is to engage with them, not to shut them off. Very hard, to, and the civil disobedience on the net would make it very hard to censor things in a big way. Well, it's, it's also true, isn't it, Nigel, that I mean, there's, there's the geographical thing we were talking about earlier, because some, something could emanate from somewhere in the Philippines or anywhere, <coughs> for the sake yeah. of argument, and be, be broadcast, as it were, here, and there's no jurisdiction. It makes it extremely difficult, as Oliver has said. It doesn't mean that you don't want to try and stop some things uh, from being accessed, just as there are all sorts of publications that we've got up to date, where uh, the government does say, no, we're not going to allow, allow uh, purely racist information coming into the public domain or uh, pornographic, paedophile uh, information coming into the domain. And therefore, I think that the government would have a role to try and do what they possibly can to prevent that sort of information being accessed by people. And that's what they've started to do with the Criminal Justice Act in 1994. I'm not saying that the Americans haven't made mistakes because they're... Um, um, indecency Act or whatever it was that they passed the other day, I think uh, perhaps was far too wide of the mark. But it doesn't mean, therefore, that the government ought to say, no, computers are separate to all of this. It's new technology, therefore we're not going to have any control but, on it. But this is but practically, how do you, how do you intend I'm, to I'm not saying make it, that? Control? I'm not saying it's easy. It's, it's extremely difficult. But so if, you're saying it's possible. Uh, well, what, what you can do, for instance, if people do download information and start spreading it around themselves and it becomes mm -hmm. known to people, then yes, uh, the government can take action and in fact has taken action on pornography being downloaded and being disseminated by other individuals and there have been cases it's come to court and people have been prosecuted. But I wonder if we move on from that, I mean it seems that in a way that the, the lack of an actual centre to, to, to the internet means that there's the, the, the law as we know it in a way has got nothing to clutch onto. I mean it's not just that, it could be libel, I mean who's stopping anybody printing libelous stuff, it could be copyright, good grief, the next Jeffrey Archer Archer novel could be pumped into the internet if anybody fancied that. There's not, nothing to stop anyone except well, certain no, decorum. I mean, there's nothing to stop that's anyone. That's beginning to happen. The illustrations that Nigel gives, of course, are within this jurisdiction where someone has put the material into the net within the United Kingdom and it's been accessed within the United Kingdom and it's possible to trace them. And then the normal conventional United Kingdom laws would apply. 
But the difficulties you raise, the difficulties of the international nature of it, it transcends nation-state boundaries. It uh, really isn't any good talking about a nation-state passing laws. And indeed, I suspect before long that the Conservative Party will get into a moral panic about the internet and will have bad legislation trying to deal with this uh, particular problem. And then Tony Blair will jump on the bandwagon. Uh, I think that uh, <laughs> well, what we have to look at is how we actually protect perhaps the most vulnerable in our society, and that I mean children. I mean, I think there are difficulties there that we need to address. Uh, and frankly, the simplest way in which to protect children is for parents not to allow the children access. I cannot imagine a situation in which I would give my children a, a line that would allow them to spend large amounts of time online surfing the internet. Well, Jenny, it's expensive is that, uh, and it's not something that I think that would be Is that the answer, really, just to stop children using it? I think that um, there are not that many children online in the UK because, as um, Jeff was saying, that the costs are quite high. And for me, the issue is that you can't judge what should go online on the basis of what children can access. And I think I'm for maximum free speech, no regulation, because I think as soon as you start accepting that we need to regulate certain types of information, even if you might find it a bit objectionable, I think then you're going down the line of inviting uh, many more controls on the networks and inviting a sense that yeah. you can't say what you want to say, you have to be careful because someone need, might you'd be looking. But you accept on the paedophile <coughs> issue, for instance, that there should be blocks? Well, I think that the whole discussion around paedophiles is a thin edge of the wage for censorship. That's used as an excuse to say, well, somehow we need to clamp down because it's antisocial behaviour. So you'd online. allow all the paedophile information and photographs up there, then? Well, I've travelled a lot online. To be honest, I haven't found any paedophile rings online. But you know, would they're you not allow people are going to be open and in public. And would you allow them? Well, I think if they're con contravening the law and they are physically abusing children, I think those people should be stopped. But I yeah. think that people should be able to say what they like to on the networks. And people who are, I mean, we never, we never want to ban innocuous speech. You always want to ban speech which is outrageous. But, but there are further difficulties there in this. Increasingly, for example, these newspapers are available online. Now, what a journalist writes in those newspapers is fairly heavily controlled in terms of the existing law. Now, do you draw then a distinction between that newspaper that happens to be physically sitting in front of us and the newspaper that's available online? Do you make the journalists write in a different way because they're online from the way that they write in the printed paper? Because if you say that it should be totally unregulated, what you're really saying is that those physical newspapers should be totally unregulated. I don't think we've quite got to that stage yet. Well, I think um, online is very different from newspapers. I think that online people can say exactly what they want to say. It's a bit like a conversation. And anyone who's been online knows there's massive, loads and loads but of but silly that's, conversations. that's the way things are now. I mean, in the future, objects like papers, books, anything, videos, the latest cassette could all be used that way. I wonder, Oliver, do you have any sort of worry that this... Uh, that the net could become a kind of uncontrollable monster in the sense that it will... It's becoming an uncontrollable monster of litigation. I mean, don't think that <laughs> libel lawyers yes. haven't noticed all this, not to mention data protection officers, intellectual property rights. Uh, my friend Neil Gaiman has a very good trick. When he finds a short story of his put up on the net, he simply sends an email saying, I think you should know that you're infringing my copyright, and though I'm very nice, I also notice you're infringing Stephen King's copyright, and his lawyers are very expensive. <laughs> and this apparently works brilliantly. But no, uh, yes, there will be huge... I mean, if you think about the car, we are now, we're still, after 100 years, trying to come to terms with what the car means to our society. There is no way that information okay. networks will have afraid, a certain I'm afraid that the very words expensive lawyers have brought me out in <laughs> a cold sweat. There's just time for me to thank my guests, Ginny Teer, Jeff Hoon, Oliver Morton and Nigel Evans. Andrew Neil will be here tomorrow night. There's no midnight hour next week because Parliament's on its halls. So I'll be back in a fortnight. Good night. <laughs>